Well, that's a um, very warm welcome. Thank you. Am I, am I eating this enough, Steve? Am I doing it right? Can everybody hear? Apparently, this thing's tricky, and I'm going to get COVID touching it to my face. <laughs> so I'm excited to be in southern Utah. I've been to northern Utah a whole bunch of times, and everybody's like, oh, you should see the south. It's pretty. You guys have a lot of cool rocks here. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> And I'm really privileged. Julie actually came up and met me in, I'm usually in Ogden, which is apparently the armpit, as somebody told me. <laughs> but this is where the Browning machine gun and 50 cal were invented, so I'm not quite sure that we should be so upset about it. <laughs> and maybe it was in Salt Lake that night, maybe it was one or the other, and she came up and, oh, this happens a lot to me, unfortunately. So if, if you have a plan, I'm about to bust you. People come up to me after events and they say, hey, I wrote this book, here, please take it and, and try to read it or something. And I'm like, okie dokie. Um, I get a lot of them. I just spoke at a pastor's conference for Turning Point USA and I think I was given over a dozen books. And I'm like, I'm not sure I can fit all these in my luggage. And so Julie gave me this book and I'm thinking, okay, here's some lady, is it like whatever. And I actually read, I didn't finish it, let's not lie. I read a lot of it and it's really good. And so I really do encourage you to take a look at the book, to get the book, to read the, if you get the book, you should read the book. <laughs> it really, I found myself reading it and I kept saying to myself, because this is what I do for a living, is go talk about this. And I thought, wow, I wish I had said it this way. I think one of my favorite lines, it's near the beginning, is that she just flat out says, communism marries truth to a lie. And I was like, why didn't I say that? <laughs> that is a perfect way to put it. There's a little bit of truth and a little bit of lie in everything they say. And so get the book, check out the documentary page, all of this. This is really, Beneath Sheep's Clothing, it's really, um, I should hold it up just in case everybody wants to see it. It's really surprisingly good given the quality of books that people give me. This one's first rate. You really should get it. So I'm very, pl very pleased to have been invited to participate in this. Uh, they interviewed me for the documentary yesterday, so if you think that what I have to say after you hear it is good, they grilled me for four hours. Uh, I'm just kidding. I just said, no, just keep going, keep going. I, I like this. So I want to tell you guys kind of what we were talking about yesterday, which is primarily the way that we, we, we now know that what's happening has a lot to do with Marxism in America. We now know that this, an American Marxist movement is happening, or American Maoist revolution is taking place. And I want to give you a cause for hope before I get into these ugly meat and potatoes. One year ago, if I stood in front of an audience, maybe even here in Utah, and said that, I'd have some heads nodding along and a lot of skepticism. So in 12 months, that has completely turned around. That's how fast America is waking up to the threat that it's under. And every communist revolution in history has exactly one thing in common, besides the communists, which is that the people that were getting put through it realized they were dealing with communism one day too late. And America's waking up very quickly. So I'm excited to speak to you all. I'm excited to get the energy going here. Julie told me that, I don't know if I'm supposed to call religious things a legend, that the fight for American liberty, there's a story in St. George that it's that St. George has an integral role to play in it. Well, maybe it's this documentary. Maybe it's something that comes out of this evening. I'm grateful. Where did he go? Where did Jason disappeared here? Oh, he's in the back. Jason, I was going to tease him because he forgot to introduce us. He said I, he sat down. He said, I had one job. It was to introduce you guys. And I forgot. <laughs> and I said, I'll tease you for that. But I like the passion he stood up with, the way that he talked to you guys, the way that he opened this up. This is absolutely key to realize that we are at a turning point moment in history in America. And it is going to take us to wake up and speak up and understand what we're dealing with, to stand undecided, to grow, to grow that spine, to get that backbone to resist and to start getting educated and organized so that we can actually do it. And that can start in any given room in America. That can start right here with all your cool rocks around. I'm really, really excited about this. So we heard in the documentary that what we're looking at is a very kind of Soviet movement. So I want to kind of go back in time. I want to talk a little bit about the history, but not too much about the history because that's Julie's bag. But in 1917, if you don't know the date, so you can work that out, it's 106 years ago, Lenin launched the Bolshevik Revolution through Russia and ends up taking over Russia and setting up within a few years after that what came to be known as the USSR, the Soviet Union. 
which held power for 69 years over Russia and its surrounding states, and things were very bad times, and this is very bad. Meanwhile, in Europe, you have sitting there during World War I a communist by the name of Antonio Gramsci. He's an Italian. He's sitting there, and he's watching. He knows what's going down in Russia, and he's watching what's not going down in Italy. He's watching what's not happening in Germany, and he's getting frustrated. He's looking, and he says, you know, the Italian Workers' Party won't organize. And World War I is raging. It's getting close to the end of the war, but it's raging. And all people in Italy care about, all the workers in Italy care about, they don't care about an international movement to end capitalism. They care about Italian nationalism. And all the Germans care about is German nationalism. And all the Brits care about is British nationalism. And he thinks, what in the world? He studied Marx. But Marx had to have gotten something wrong. And so here's this leading light, if we can call it a light, of Marxist thought. He is probably the most prolific Marxist writer. He wrote a book that's summarized now under the title The Prison Notebooks. You can guess where he wrote it. That's just over 3,000 pages long of some of the most erudite Marxist theory that's ever been written. And it is the roadmap for how the West has been conquered. And he's sitting there thinking, what is it that Marx got wrong? What is it that stops communism from taking over the West? Why won't our workers unite internationally and take hold of this moment? Why are they so concerned with nationalist movements instead? What did he get wrong? Because he looks at Russia and he says, well, you know, that's fine, good for Lenin, and he was a fan of Lenin's. That was exactly what I was going to say, too. <laughs> what what is, it, what is it Lenin did right? Well, he, he conquered a bunch of peasants. But Marx said it's going to be the industrial centers that are going to go to communism and socialism first. Not a peasant backwards farmer society. So something's not lining up. Berlin is supposed to go. Industrial parts of Italy are supposed to go. Paris is supposed to go. New York, London are supposed to all go communist. Not Moscow not backwards parts of Ukraine. What in the world has gone wrong? Why does the, the West repel communism? And he realized that the West has very strong cultural institutions and that those cultural institutions are very effective at transmitting values from one generation to the next. Peasants have this, but it turns out that they're pretty easy to bully. They're pretty easy to boss around. When you actually have a developed society, it's harder to do that if they have strong cultural institutions and can transmit them from one generation to the next. This is the birth, by the way, of a conspiracy theory, apparently. If you look up what I'm talking about right now in Wikipedia, as of a couple of years ago, because I remember seeing it before it changed, you type in these infamous words, cultural Marxism. Wikipedia, to go type that in your search engine, what does it pop up? It says, cultural Marxism conspiracy theory. I have a, po <laughs> I'm not kidding, I have a profile with the Southern Poverty Law Center right now that bills me as a conspiracy theorist for promoting the cultural Marxist conspiracy theory. The cultural Marxist conspiracy theory was this. This is where Antonio Gramsci said, well, if we're going to take over the West, if we're going to get communism in the West, if we're going to achieve his main goal, which was, and I quote, socialism is precisely the religion that must overcome Christianity throughout the West, if we're going to do that, we have to infiltrate the cultural producing institutions, take them over, and make them produce communist culture instead. And he identified five key institutions to take over society. They are religion, family, education, media, and law. If you get those, you can turn a society, you can in one generation or two generations transform the culture from within using education and media. You can dismantle the family that might hold things together. You can transform faith so that it's a fake imitation of real religion that promotes communist values. And you can subvert the law so that when you end up, say, trying to stop some of the things that are happening and you take them to court, the judge rules the wrong way. So we live in the, the world created by Antonio Gramsci. 
His model was tested for the first time in human history by a famous man named Mao Zedong, who very successfully deployed it to transform China. It came to the West, translated into English in 1970. Do you know where it was translated? Notre Dame, whoops, I said it in French. Notre Dame University. <laughs> Notre Dame University. Do you know who translated Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks into English? His name, he has an interesting last name that'll stick in your mind in a second. You won't ever forget it. His name is Joseph Buttigieg. He has a famous son who is our secretary, uh, Department of Secretary, it was a sec the Secretary of, the, of Transportation. That's what I'm looking for, Department of something. I can't speak tonight either, Jason. <laughs> I only do this for a living. Um, yeah, so our, our, our Secretary of Transportation is the son of the man who translated the, culture, the father of cultural Marxism into English. Bit of a red diaper baby, you might su suppose. So it turns out that they've been wildly successful. We had these hearings. There's this famous guy, Senator Joseph McCarthy. Everybody looks back and says, well, that's a bad guy in history. He was putting people on lists. He was cancel culture. He was, you know, on a crusade to chase communists out of government and Hollywood in particular. And he, he was right. <laughs> turns out he was absolutely right. And so it turns out that they got media a long time ago. So they can propagandize the population. I just recently learned, in fact, I didn't know this, why did everything go crazy about 10 years ago? Well, it was in 2013 that the Obama administration changed the law to allow the open propaganda dissemination in the United States. They started to propagandize the American people legally for the first time in 2013. These propaganda techniques, however, have been coming in through the media for a century, and Joseph McCarthy knew that. So I'm going to have a conspiracy theory about supporting Joseph McCarthy now. That's fine. <laughs> Dear Media Matters, please write an article. I look so good every time you do. <laughs> so this is the world that we actually occupy, is that they've been colonizing these cultural institutions for a century. In 1917, Lenin did his thing. By 1919, there was a communist party in the United States trying to figure out ways to subvert the U.S., and they slowly started to adopt cultural Marxist uh, techniques rather than kind of more brazen techniques over the history of the 20th century. And they particularly had to focus on figuring out how to undo America's strongest backbones, which were family, faith, and education. Law they figured they could get. Law they know is downstream from education. It's not hard. Every lawyer goes to school. You want to be a lawyer? Where you got to go? Law school, where you go first? college. They know they've got a captive audience if they can get a hold of education so that the law can be subverted in a generation. So they know how to get that one. That works with the media too. But how do you get religion? You don't go to college actually to get into religion. Yeah, you can go to seminary and that's a big deal, but you don't have to. We have total religious liberty in this country. You can study the book for yourself. You can start to speak for yourself. You can put together a church for yourself and the government can't tell you no. So they can't get that. How do you wedge into family, which has been this backbone of this pioneer nation? Well, social media has been very effective for that later, but how do you do that when you're looking at this from like 1920? How do you get into the family? So education, religion, and family were the big targets. And those are the three things that it turns out that Julie's documentary touches on the most, and those are the three things that I actually kind of want to talk about. So education was actually a key cornerstone for this because if you get education, you kind of get inroads to everything else. The program that Gramsci laid out to make uh, socialism the religion that would overwhelm and replace Christianity, has got, it got the name The Long March Through the Institutions in the 1960s. Okay? So The Long March Through the Institutions got kind of written about by a theorist and strategist, a Marxist by the name of Herbert Marcuse, uh, in 1972 in his book called Counter-Revolution and Revolt. And what Marcuse had just done is he had radicalized a nation in the 1960s to go out into the streets to get racial agitation, to get sexual liberation, to get all these things that happened in the 1960s and all these riots that ended up in the 1960s. This was the first attempt at a cultural Marxist or neo-Marxist revolution in the United States and it didn't work. So in 1972, frustrated, he writes this book, Counter-Revolution and Revolt, and he says, no, we've got to do the long march to the institutions 
that Rudy Deutschke mentioned. We've got to go into the institutions. We're not going to be outsiders yelling from the street anymore. We're going to get jobs. We're going to get educated in communist ideology or Marxist ideology or neo-Marxist ideology or critical theory, whichever thing. I'm just going to simplify and call it communist ideology because it's ultimately what it is. We're going to get educated in the ideology and we're going to go in to the professions. We're going to learn to program computers and we're going to program computers, but we're also going to teach our office about these values. We're going to, in particular, he said, go into every level of education. And so a guy named Isaac Gottesman, another communist, wrote a book called The Critical Turn in Education. He published it in 2016 at Iowa State. And the first sentence of the book asks the question, where did all those 60s radicals go? Where did Herbert Marcuse's disciples go after the 60s? Did they all just calm down? Where did they go? And he says, well, not to the religious cults and not to yuppiedom. No, to the classroom. And so they started to work their way into education. And this has been the project of my last year and a half of research, is how in the world did they transform education? So this is where the threat to your children is. And if you don't understand this threat, we can't stop this threat. You probably realize that they're doing really awful things with the kids in schools. And you probably, if you've got a voice and you've spoke up, you've probably said something, some of you have, and you said, I don't want critical race theory, or I don't want this gender ideology, or whatever it happens to be taught at the schools, and they came back to you with the stunningly untrue statement, we're not teaching that at the school. And then they tell you some lie about some other thing and some complicated 10-syllable word with four hyphens in it, and you don't know what they're talking about, but they're definitely not doing it. Right? They tell you they're just not doing it. It's not there. And then you say, they're, or they, they're, they're even more insidious. This just happened to a friend of mine at a very conservative, it turns out, Christian school in Dallas, Texas, famous, you know, liberal bastion of Texas. And so his kid's school's going woke. He challenges. He's very, very educated on the issue now. This is a conservative Christian private school, by the way, not a government school. And he calls them out, and what do they say? Oh, well, we don't think that that's happening. Can you give us specific examples? And so every specific example he offered, they explained why it's not a specific example. This is the game that we're all playing. So if we don't learn to see how they've transformed education, we can't call it out. And so it's really insidious. They did two things. They stole the purpose of education first, which they're going to use to do the next step, and they've stolen the mechanism of education, which is virtually complete, and that's how they lie to you, and that's the nuts and bolts for your average parent or grandparent trying to figure out what's going on with your kids. The purpose of education. A lot of people, what's the purpose of education? Why do you get education? Well, I used to teach math. I used to poll my students every semester at the beginning of the, at the term. Why are you here? Are you in college to get a degree, or are you in college to get educated? And I let them pick, but they can only pick one. And overwhelmingly, 95 plus percent of the kids were there to get a degree. They were not the least bit interested in getting educated. This is because we've faced 50 years of relentless propaganda that the reason you go to college is to get a good job. You go to college to get a piece of paper that lets you get a job. And the second we accepted that as a culture, that the reason you get educated is to get a job. Rather than it being a consequence of getting an education that you can get a job, but we said, no, the reason you go to college is to get a good job. The reason you get educated is to get a job. We gave the game away. The communists stole the purpose of education. The purpose of education ceased to be about raising educated, virtuous, competent adults who can navigate life in a society and began to be about getting a credential that lets them through a door that somebody gets to decide they can't walk through without that piece of paper. In other words, they created a chokehold or a bottleneck for the professional world. You can't get in unless you get the piece of paper. Well, if they capture any of the institutions that generate that piece of paper, you can't get in without being a communist, without at least mouthing communist ideology or thinking communist thoughts. So they stole the purpose of education by making it about credentials. And we all went along with it. And we haven't thought about it. We haven't stopped to consider what is education really for? Well, now we have to. Because for the first time in our history, we are facing the fact that our government is so out of line, that our professional accrediting bodies are so out of control, 
that our teacher education system is so wholly corrupt that the only option you have to raise your children free of that influence or minimizing that influence is to homeschool. It's the only option you have, and they will take that from you too as soon as they can. The Washington Post has already started a series of art articles and essays all summer long railing on how homeschooling is only okay if it's fully regulated. <laughs> yeah, I hear I have some homeschoolers in the room. You guys have heard this before, you've won this fight before, but this fight hasn't gone away. But that forces the question on parents, on everyday people, why are we educating our kids? Is it to get them a piece of paper or is it to make them functional citizens? And when you wrestle with that, you realize what the answer has to be, and we can start to take that back by denying these credential-driven aspects of education. Now, the second thing is more insidious. You don't deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis, though as you start to shift more and more into homeschooling, you will. What you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is that the mechanism of education has been stolen. And so a communist by the name of Paulo Freire, who was in Brazil, that's why his name is hard to spell, studied what Mao Zedong did in his revolutionary high schools and his revolutionary colleges, and he said, this is a great model of education. He says this in a footnote in his most important book, which is called Pedagogy of the Oppressed, published in 1970. He says that he bases his model largely off of what he saw working in China. He also adapted it from post-colonial stuff and some other things, he, and he sort of made it up. But his whole goal was, we're not going to use the academic lessons or the reading lessons to learn to read words or do math or whatever else. We're going to learn to read society. We're going to learn to read politics. A true education, he said, isn't about academic exercises. It's about becoming politically awake. And so what they did is they, what he did, was he devised a method of education where the academic lesson becomes a mediator, in his words, to true political knowledge. The teacher ceases to be a teacher and becomes a facilitator into the right understanding of political circumstances in the real lives of children. Now I give that description, the teacher is a facilitator into the, uh, you know, the, the contents, the real political interpretation of the experiences of, uh, in the lives of children, you might think, well, that sounds something like, you know, that the education has to be culturally relevant, which is the word that it got repackaged into in the 90s. So this culturally relevant teaching, when you went to the school and said, I don't want them teaching CRT, and they said, well, we don't teach critical race theory, we teach a different CRT, culturally relevant teaching, it's good for the kids. It has to be culturally relevant to get them engaged. It's just the same program repackaged. Culturally relevant teaching is the Marxist theft of education repackaged out of its original name, which is Frarian Critical Pedagogy. And the goal with that is to use the academic lesson as an excuse to have political conversations that you give the right answers to the kids so they will believe the right political things about their circumstances in life. And it goes like this. This is a real example from a real teacher training done in, again, yet another liberal bastion in the country, Indiana, good farm country, real teacher training, real example, second grade math lesson. The teacher who gave me this example told me that by the end of the training, they had learned to be able to do this, not just to this one special example, but to anything, any academic lesson, they could transform it into a political lesson. And here's how it goes. Get ready for a math quiz. It's second grade level, so we'll see if you are smarter than a second grader. I did this in a talk somewhere in South Carolina, I think, and I had a second grader in the, or in, the, in the class, in the room, in the audience, and as soon as I read the question, by the way, he shouted out the answer, so you, the pressure is on. <laughs> so Johnny is riding in the car with his mom and dad on the way to the amusement park. The amusement park is 50 miles away. They've already driven 30 miles. How much further is there to go? And if you're embarrassed and don't know the answer, that's okay. I'm not actually going to make you raise your hand. So what the teachers are taught to do, now imagine first you're the parent, right? So you're like, something funny is going on at school, I want to see your homework. So they pull out their homework and like, because they're seven, and they hand it to you finally, and you look at it, and that's what's on the paper, and you're like, 
Okay, go do your homework. Who cares, right? Johnny's riding the car with his mom and dad on the way to the amusement park. Okay, great. 50, 30, there's some other number involved. It's 20. Okay, great. Don't tell him the answer. He's got to figure it out himself. The teachers are not taught to do what you're supposed to do in a math lesson. Now, if you haven't taught math before, the point of the mathematics word problem lesson is here's words, make a mathematical expression, answer the mathematical question, give the answer back in words. So you have a paragraph, the kid's supposed to write down 50 minus 30 equals 20, and then say they have 20 miles left to go. That's what they're supposed to be teaching the second grader to do. But they're taught in teacher training, no. We have to get the kids engaged. They'll think these examples are boring. Some kids are going to raise their hand and say, why do we have to learn math? This is boring. And so you have to get them engaged or they won't want to learn and their learning outcomes will be bad. That's why nobody's learning math. The kids aren't engaged. So we've got to make it relevant to them. So hey class, you ask them, who's ever been to an amusement park? Seems like an innocuous question. You want to make the second graders have fun, right? So this is what Paulo Ferreri called a generative theme. He had a technical term for it. Generative because it generates a political discussion. So you think, what? Amusement park? Who's ever been to an amusement park? Well, guess what? There's seven. So some kids have and some kids haven't, for sure, right? So some kids raise their hand and some kids don't. And now you have difference. And you can wedge into that difference. You can make that difference a point of conversation. OK, so some of you have kids. Some of you haven't. What are some reasons why some of you would have got to go, but some of you have not? Why is it that some kids haven't been to an amusement park? And they are taught in the teacher training to let the kids say whatever kids say the darndest things that they're going to say until one of them says something like, some people can't afford it. At which point you say, that's right. Some people can't afford to go. It's expensive to go to an amusement park, isn't it, guys? It's really expensive. How could we make sure everybody can afford to go to an amusement park? And now you're permitted for the next 40 minutes to talk about socialism. Make the rich people pay for it. Make it free. Make the government pay. With seven-year-olds. If there's a racial disparity in the kids that raise their hands, all, more white kids raise their hands, fewer black kids raise their hands, something like this, immediately you can seize upon this. Well, why is it that so many of the white kids got to go but the black kids haven't got to go? And you can wedge in a critical race theory lesson. Maybe you push in a different direction. Maybe the first kid that says something politically useful is, my mom says we're not old enough. Now you get to have a conversation about parental authority. Should parents really be allowed to make decisions? That's not fair. So now the parents are the enemy. And we go back to Antonio Gramsci for a second, who said that we have to figure out how to drive a wedge into the cultural institution of family. And now you're building one. Some parents aren't fair. Should parents be allowed to decide things like that that's not fair to your classmates? Your friends didn't even get to go. That's not fair. And the kids who don't get to go, yeah, that's not fair. When do I get to go? And now they're building out a wedge between the kid and the parent. And all they have to say is, maybe we can put together. They don't have to promise anything. Maybe we can put together a field trip and I'll go to the amusement park together. Maybe the school can make sure you guys all go. Would you want the school to take you? Instead of having class, we could go to the amusement park? Yeah, yeah, you know, right? This is called a generative theme in Ferrarian education. And that's why when you look at the homework, you see nothing. And they say, we're not teaching critical race theory here. Look at the curriculum you had to get a Freedom of Information Act request to look at that they didn't want to give you and you charged you money and tried to sue you for requesting. And you get this thing and you're like, there's nothing here. And then that's what they're actually doing with it. They're being taught to teach that way. And you may have guessed that mom and dad is a generative theme. Do all families, kids, you know, there's, Johnny's riding with his mom and dad to the amusement park. Do all families have a mom and dad? I only have a mom at home. Now you're having a conversation about feminism. My friend has two moms. We know where that one goes. The Gay Straight Alliance Club or Gender Sexuality Alliance Club meets after school. Anybody feel like maybe they're born in the wrong body? Let's go. No kidding. Those conversations come up in that way. The word problem becomes a mediator to a political conversation. There's one more generative theme. One sentence, by the way. One sentence at a second grade level, three generative themes. 
Do you know what the third one was? We've got amusement park, we've got mom and dad, car. Is it really good for the environment for us to drive in a car to go have fun? And they can have a conversation about sustainable development goal, whichever number it is, to make sure that the good global citizen kids care about pollution. We're polluting the air with all of our cars. Wouldn't it be better if we didn't have cars? I'm not kidding. These are the conversations in the state of Indiana that were being taught to teachers in professional development training about how to be more engaging with the students for second grade math class. And those are the dialogues that take place in the classroom. That is the mechanism by which they stole how education is done. And unless you know that that's what they're doing, you have no chance of being able to show up and say, this has to stop. You have no chance to be able to articulate what's going on and how it's done. Now, why do they care? I mean, obviously that works. It's very insidious. It should make you kind of mad. Why did they do this kind of on a grand scheme plan? It's because what they realized was that Western civilization suffers from what they called the problem of reproduction. Western civilization reproduces itself from one generation to the next, and the school is a key component in how, how a society reproduces itself. Remember we talked about the credential function, you go to college to get a good job, well that's actually their logic. When they say stuff like that, they're not just being insidious, that's actually how they think. They think the school should just be a credentialing thing that credentials people that are suitable to them to get the jobs that they need so that they can plug you into the society they want to build and nobody else gets to have it because you're probably deplorable or you didn't get vaccinated or something. You're racist, you're transphobe, you can't have a good job. We can't allow you to work at a Fortune 100 company if you're a racist or if you have any values that we can code as racist or if you've ever said anything that might signify that. So this is exactly the way that they already think about education. Well, that's what it actually comes back to. The problem of reproduction is that, well, you go to school to learn how to be productive in the existing economy, in the existing society, so that you get, in, they'll tell you, indoctrinated or brainwashed into the values of the existing society so that you'll go out and get a good job and be productive in it. That's literally how they think about the situation. So what is the Marxist goal every time? That's, a, that's what? That's a means of production. So they're going to seize that means of production and put it to service for themselves. It's just the means of production of your children and their future that they're seizing there. So this is actually what they did. They said we solve the problem of reproduction by making it so that we can't just do blanket, you know, Soviet-style brainwashing in the schools. The parents will revolt. What we have to do is use this method of critical education where what we do is we find all of these problems, racism, sexism, classism, poverty, environmental issues, whatever the leftist issue of the day is, we get all of these issues and we use the academic lesson as an excuse to have the political conversation about that so nobody notices that it's happening. And then you get a bunch of architecture from the federal government's Department of Education set up so that if the teachers aren't doing that, they don't get any federal funding for their school district. And that's called Common Core. Now it's called Every Student Succeeds Act, the ESSA, which expands this accountability requirement. By the way, we aren't just going to throw Democrats under the bus here. Let's be very fair. ESSA came in under Obama. Common Core came under, in, under Obama, too, earlier in Obama's his first term versus his second term. W brought in, George W. Bush brought in No Child Left Behind. That's where the accountability nightmare started for federal dollars. We have a crisis in education. We've got to fix it. I'm from the government. I'm here to help. We're going to get accountability on these schools. Well, guess what? The communists know how to take a hold of any accountability structure and twist it to their purposes. And they did. And with Common Core, it went to the level we've never seen before. And these are the kinds of things that they had to report. How are you teaching? What are you teaching? It wasn't even about the test scores anymore, like it was under No Child Left Behind. It was about test scores. Then it was about how and what are you teaching. Then it transformed under ESSA to not just be how and what are you teaching in terms of academic competencies, but we must assess also non-academic competencies, in particular social and emotional development. Social and emotional learning comes in through the back door this way. Schools have to teach 
or they have to be assessed on how well they are meeting the social and emotional development needs, which by the way is a total province of the parent, of the kids. That's parent stuff, clap for that. The school found a way to bring it in to where now they're doing it. They're parenting. This is why Moms for Liberty, one of their slogans is, we do not co-parent with the government. That's a powerful message. That's what they've figured out how to do is to make it so the school co-parents. And they're expanding that as we speak. You all this youth mental health initiatives that they're doing. Well, the kids are traumatized. COVID, learning loss, all this trauma, you know, dramatic stuff happening in society. Nobody knows what their future is. They all believe that climate change is going to kill them in 12 years, starting every day, 12 years from that day. It's kind of a rolling 12 years. But they're paralyzed with ex existential fears. They're stressed out. All, they've, they're traumatized. They have mental health issues, depression, anxiety. Their schools are out of control. They're violent. They're not learning things. They're stressed out. We've got to have mental health issues. Because somehow, the school becomes the dragnet that'll catch everybody. So obviously, the school is where we have to provide now mental and behavioral health services that will be paid for by Medicaid and regulated by the CDC. Anybody trust the CDC after the last couple of years? Well, it's about to rule your school. And their partnership has already been made with the International Planned Parenthood Foundation. Because... Emotional or mental and behavioral health is step one, but sexual health is step two. And then full clinic health is step three. The school becomes de facto a clinic for children or a hospital for children. It's like Walmart. There's multiple departments in the same store. It's real convenient for the parent. It really is like Walmart, by the way. It's the same model. It's the same program. It's the big box model. They call them community schools, though, instead. So this is actually the way that they've stolen education in terms of its purpose. Its real objective was to break the, 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 the problem of reproduction, to make it so that we don't reproduce societies one generation to the next. In other words, we break. We find some generation where we say, that's it, we're done. The next generation is going to be totally different, new values. What Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse called a new sensibility. And the new sensibility will overcome the shortcomings of the present Social system and economic system. You see, Marcuse in 1964, a few years earlier, wrote a book called One Dimensional Man, and he said, well, you know, socialism has the right ideology. It does, but he's looking over at the collapse of the Soviet, well, it's not collapsed yet, but the faltering of the Soviet Union. Khrushchev has come out and com confessed to the crimes of Stalin. It's not looking good. Soviet Union is not a bright spot on the international stage in 1964. It exists. It's awful. It's not a shining star on a big red flag anymore. And Marcuse is like, well, it's got the right ideology, but it can't produce. So there's another problem called the problem of production we have to figure out how to solve. And he says, but you know what? We know something that solves that, capitalism. He says capitalism actually delivers the goods. It allows people, he said, to build a better life. And he says, in fact, it is a good life. This is a communist writing in 1964 explaining Capitalism allows people to build a better life, and it is a good life. That's what he says. So what's wrong with capitalism? It's not, what's the word of the decade? Sustainable. It produces and overproduces and over overproduces until finally it strips the world of all of its resources and the world collapses in uh, terrible tragedy or in the quest to secure resources for a smaller and smaller set of people, it launches nuclear weapons and it initiates a total cataclysm. Capitalism is not sustainable. So we need productive socialism, but we also need sustainable capitalism. Well, what's our favorite buzzword in the 2020s? Sustainability, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals to transform our world for Agenda 2030. I'm, I told you I'm a conspiracy theorist. I mean, never mind that if you go to the UN website, it's literally the top thing. Yeah, I'm a conspiracy theorist. Sustainability is necessary for our, our economics. The chairman of the World, World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, recently said in an interview that we're changing the whole social contract. We're changing the sensibility of society, what we're all agreed to as citizens. And what we're changing it is from an economy of production and consumption to an economy, I kid you not, he said this, of caring and sharing. They, of course, will decide what you're going to care about and who is going to share with whom and how. But that's the objective. 
We're going to have a sustainable and inclusive future. The sustainable part deals with the economics and the inclusion deals with the social aspects. Now, I was telling Julie yesterday, every time I think I'm smart and I'm like, aha, that came from Mao. Or aha, that came from whoever, Marcuse. Turns out it came from like Lenin or Stalin every single time. You can always go back a step. So Stalin actually had a bunch of writing that he did in the 30s where he explained that after we complete economic equality, then we're going to get true communist equality by leveling the social playing field. The word for that in the modern parlance is equity. We'll have true social justice that follows from having true social equity. And you've heard of equity. The definition of equity, tell me if this sounds like any other word you know, the definition of equity, the actual definition of equity is an administered political economy in which shares are adjusted so that citizens are made equal. Does it sound like socialism to anybody? It is socialism. It's just got a new wrapper around it. You know, it's like got sheep's clothing. What's beneath sheep's clothing? Well, equity, sheep's clothing, peel it back. Whoa, socialism, there it is. It's weird, it has the same definition. And so Stalin had this idea. Mao did this. He did a political revolution in 1949, took over China, got the CCP in charge. And then in 1966, he started a cultural revolution so that he could take over even more, actually so he could get his power back because they kicked him out in 62 because he only messed up and killed 55 million people. And he deposed the CCP that replaced him and consolidated his power with a social justice revolution. When Pol Pot launched his revolution in Cambodia, killed 25% of his own people. You look at it, and in terms of communist genocides and the absolute numbers, is only 3 million. You're like, that's not that many. 55 million in China. 25% of the Cambodian population was murdered by Pol Pot in the name of, and he said it himself, social justice. So this whole thing that we've been dealing with, because we have redwashed education and have learned nothing about the history of communism, would have been visible as communism to us all very clearly, unambiguously, where we don't have a bunch of fools on TV tricking us years ago if we would have actually been educated to know what communism was about. That is maybe their most successful hijacking of the education system is having removed any lessons about what communism looks like. Of course, that gives us a very simple pathway to a solution. We start demanding anti-communist education in all of our states, all of them. I can tell you for absolute certain, uh, absolute certainty that this is a valuable and correct thing to do, not because I'm smart, not because of theory, but because the woke always tell you when you've done the right thing by absolutely losing their marbles and saying crazy stuff. So it turns out one state tried this already. I didn't tell them to do it. They thought it up all by themselves as far as you know. The state of Virginia a few months ago attempted to mandate the true history of communism be taught in all Virginia schools as a, as, as a mandatory piece of curriculum. It was shot down in a complete 100% party line vote by the Democrats, killed, and then the media campaign raged and said that the Republicans in Virginia were trying to start anti-Asian sentiment and hate by teaching them about Asian communists so that the kids would learn to hate Chinese people. So you know that they don't want that. You know that that would be uh, an injury to, their, to their, their cause if we started to educate about that because we would start to undo meaningfully their conquering of education. If we started to teach anti-communist education, start to get states to require it. Now, I have a feeling that Governor he, him here isn't going to sign that one <laughs> if you get it in Utah. Yes, Spencer is a special pet project of mine. <laughs> and of course, you'll come out and say that he's for it, and then you'll say you never remembered ever hearing about it. In the yes, of course. But this is something that can actually be pushed for. This is very practical. This is actually something that should have been happening all along anyway. This is not a radical change to anything. And I tell you, it will provoke them 
to the levels of insanity that will red pill, as they say, so many more citizens of this country. Wait a minute, why aren't we allowed to teach that? Why don't they want us to know about that history? All you have to say is we do a great job teaching about the history of fascism and Nazis. We do a great job with that, and I think it should extend to other tyrannical regimes, including communism, so we're going to have true anti-communist education, which, by the way, if you have homeschooling, you should definitely be including that in your modules. And they will flip the flip out. <laughs> You will find out which of your uh, Republicans are rhinos in a hurry <laughs> on that one. And I have a feeling in Utah you'll discover it because I mentioned Klaus Schwab. If you didn't know, uh, I believe this was also a governor he, him proclamation. Utah, Jason wasn't wrong when he said that this is ground zero. Utah was declared the cradle of the fourth industrial revolution, which is the name of the project that Davos, that the World Economic Forum is trying to foist on the world. The difference between the other three, by the way, is that the fourth evol uh, industrial revolution changes you. Steve wanted me to talk about brain chips and stuff. I'm not going there, but that's kind of part of that. So this is what they did with education. You can see very clearly why your children are in so much danger. I don't have to stand up here and talk about the hazards, the realities, the grotesque realities. I don't want to talk about the grotesque realities of what's happening through gender ideology and trans. I can tell you, however, that Mao is very much responsible for the model that we're using that's leading that to happen. Why are there so many kids suddenly becoming trans? Well, all you got to do is ask any basic white girl and they'll tell you it's not cool to be a white, normal person. It's not cool. I was talking to somebody recently and this was a big deal in their family. Their son, 14 years old, comes home and was like, Mom, will you still love me if I'm not gay? And she's, she's a little off kilter with that one, like she thought the question might go the other way, you know. And he, she's like, what do you mean? Well, and he says, well, you know, there's so much pressure on us to become gay, so much pressure. And like, you know, parents, you see, we see all these examples of parents who celebrate and accept that. And I figured you, maybe that you're like that and you'd be mad at me. Talk about levels of perversion into the brain of these poor kids thinking about how against them their parents might be. And then she was like, well, I love you, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, give me the straight answer. And so they had a little conversation, and she was like, well, just, I guess, since we're talking about it, are you gay? He was like, Mom, I wear sweatpants. <laughs> that was a no. And so, but he was scared, right? So this is the kind, I could talk about a lot of this, but what Mao did was he set up an identity politics regime. He set up the first real identity politics regime. The Soviets had a lot more brutal methods. They didn't need this. What he did was he created identity classes related to communism. Five of them were bad. They were things like uh, landlord, rich farmer, counter-revolutionary, right-winger, and bad influence. Those are really the five. He added another one later that was revisionist. And then he created five good identities. They were red for communist. And they were things like work or laborer, they have hammers, and then peasants, they have sickles. And they were fake, really. The, I mean, I know a woman who was a red identity because her family was born in China. Uh, in the Cultural Revolution, they were dirt poor peasants. So she was given a red identity because she's the sickle, right? Yeah, they remain dirt poor. Dirt poor, starvation poor throughout the entirety of her time in China. Just because they had the red identity didn't mean that they had it good. They just didn't get bullied and dragged into the street and beaten and things. The black identities, however, got really bullied. And the black identities were inheritable. If you had land, which might not be very much land, in fact, you could have been labeled a uh, rich farmer if you were a farmer and you had, it was China, so bear with me, two walks, two pans to cook in, not one, two, you were rich. And if you had a black rich person identity, bourgeois mentality, so did your kids by default. And so they treated your kids like crap at school because they have a black identity. All they had to do was denounce their family and join the revolutionary cadres because the other, three re the other three categories of red identities were revolutionary things. Revolutionary activist, revolutionary cadre, which was the name for a leader, and then revolutionary martyr. If you died for the cause, you and some of your family would, would go on to get red identities. If you laid down your life as an adult for, for the communists, your kids would get red identities. And the red guard and the Communist Party people and all the people who had status in society had to have red identities. You want to go to the nice high school or to the high school at all, you have to have a red identity. You want to go to the university, you have to have a red identity. 
This is, and you could lose it at any, mo at any moment. So he created not just a desire to be in the red identities, but a pressure pump to push people, push kids in particular, into a, pressure, uh, into a red identity. Sell out your parents, red identity. A lot of your seven-year-olds, by the way, are a little sociopathic still and will sell you out for a lollipop. They grow out of it, but it's true. It's not hard to push. Why are they targeting children so much? It's not hard to brainwash children. Much harder to brainwash adults. Not hard to brainwash impressionable kids, especially when their whole education system got retooled from day one. The first thing Mao did when he took power was fired every teacher, sent them to special re-education and communist socialist methods, only when they passed the satisfactory test were they allowed back in the classroom. First thing he did in 1950, so 1952 after that, everything was communist education. So every kid's getting raised in a brainwashing indoctrination environment as it is, not hard to get them to start selling out their parents, which is the, I know we've got Christianity and all these religion in the United States, they don't have that there. Family piety is the religion in China. There's Buddhism and some other stuff, but family piety is number one, Confucian piety. To Denounce your father is the greatest sin. And they got kids to do it left, right, and center. It was identity politics. Well, today we use different identities. If you have white skin, you're the worst kind of person. You can't change that. If you have, you can be an ally, though. If you have straight, you know, you're male especially. These are problems. Able-bodied, not mentally ill. No kidding, like they list their mental illnesses on their profiles on the internet. If you have nothing wrong with you, if you're normal, you have black identity. You could become an ally, you could become an activist, but that's loose. But you could also adopt a queer gender or sexual identity, something out of the normal. You could be pansexual, you could be Demi-romantic, all these kind of made up things that all have flags. And the second that you decide you're on that pathway, they celebrate you, they affirm you, blah, 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 the whole nine yards, but you're also now in a good identity. The more revolutionary you are with it, the better you are. They try to stamp out any residual internalized homophobia, internalized transphobia, internalized racism. This all follows not just an identity politics formula that Mao laid out, but a formula for transforming the nation that Mao laid out that was called Unity Criticism Unity. He says he developed this in 1942. He bragged about how effective it was in 1957 that it had transformed China at a fundamental level, at the values level. And what he said was that unit, you start with creating a desire for unity. We all want to be a country that's unified or in the modern parlance, we want to have a place where everybody feels like they belong. We just want a school where everybody feels included. They all feel welcome, like they belong. Then you begin criticism. We can't have that. We can't have a place where everybody feels like they belong because some of the people in here are transphobic and our trans friends can't belong. They don't feel welcome. So we have to overcome your transphobia. So we're gonna criticize that. Some of you have racist ideas or engage in racist systems. You know, you have to be in behaviors. You just engage in systems that uphold racism. You have thoughts that uphold racism. So our fellow learners of color don't feel welcome. We could have unity if you guys fixed yourselves. We could have unity, Joe Biden literally stood up and used that word, if we didn't have a pandemic of the unvaccinated. It's the exact same thing. And Mao said, on the other side, you can have unity again. Unity, criticism, unity on a new basis, he said. And that basis he called socialist discipline. We call it sustainable and inclusive future. You will have sustainable, inclusive values and be a good global citizen and we will have unity on a new basis. It's the exact same formula. This is why we're seeing this explosion in the transgender movement with young women in particular. This is why we're seeing the explosions in pride and all of these kind of provocations. There are provocations too, literal provocations, but they also need those things and they've written papers and explained that those things, Drag Queen Story Hour is, they said, a generative educational opportunity. That's in their own language. One of the leaders of the entire Drag Queen Story Hour program says it's a generative educational opportunity. 
So you throw drag queens out in front of kids and they start asking questions that become excuses for political conversations. You put a gay kiss in a Disney movie, maybe there's in some sense nothing wrong with that. Why is it there? Why is it a big deal? Because the kids are going to go ask a question about it. And now we're justified in having a political conversation about it in which there is a right answer. The right answer isn't, well, that's sometimes what adults do, which is a pretty hands-off answer. The right answer is, well, let's talk about a civil rights movement and let's talk about blah, 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 blah. Have you seen the gender-bred person? Did you know you might have been born in the wrong body? This is what it's about. It's all generative excuses to do that. Now, we have to talk about religion as well. You have a, I think, keen sense of how integral and granular detail, how much granular detail there is in how they've transformed education, what they're doing with it. This is why, at this point, I screamed as a public school advocate for years and years and years, and I'm like, nope, you got one option, it's called homeschool. You got one option right now. If you want to protect your children, it's homeschool. Here's why. Because I do believe we can fix the schools, and I believe we must fix the schools, and I believe that we, even if we pull our kids out, must fix the schools. We must turn back around. I say that the building's on fire, so what's the first thing you do? You go and you make sure your kid gets out of the fire. And what kind of person are you if you sit there and let that building burn? You have to go back and put the fire out. This is what we have to do. But, and the reason that I say we have to homeschool is because I don't know what grade your kids are in. Let's say they're in fourth grade. So they graduate in 12th grade. You can do the math problem. That's like eight years. We're not fixing this in eight years. Your kids will graduate before the schools are fixed. Turns out kids age out of schools pretty quickly. They grow up pretty fast. I know in the day-to-day -day trenches it doesn't feel that way. I did that too. But they grow up pretty fast. And we're not fixing this systemic level problem in just a handful of years. Maybe in some localities we will if we can start wresting power away from the federal government and the states. But most, for the most part, we're not fixing local level schools. We got a problem with curriculum. We got a problem with educational materials and books. We got a problem with the accreditation system. All of that's captured. Even if we could fix that, we don't have any teachers hardly at all. We don't have a method for producing teachers that aren't caught up in a communist education program. So we've got a lot to do. So you have to protect your kids. You got to homeschool, but you got to turn around. We've got to fight for those schools because it is the fact. I know that we should all do our responsibility. It's the fact that not everybody can do this. It's hard. It's doable. It's amazing. It's rewarding. I, I've met the kids. They're all brilliant. It's actually really good for the kids, um, but it's, it's a challenge, and most people are probably not going to do it, so we've got to fix the schools. We've got to get back a society where we can trust our systems and have systems that support things, so we've got to get this back in, in order. Now, the thing is, the way they did this is what I told you earlier, this long march to the institutions is happening not just in the schools, but also in the churches. So how do you take over family? Well, you create those wedges. How do you take over the schools? Well, you get inside of them and you transform the curriculum. By the way, Isaac Gottesman, who I mentioned earlier, said that Paulo Ferreri had become located where he is today, writing this in 2016. He said where he is today, which is everywhere in colleges of education by 1992. That's how long the Marxists explicitly have owned colleges of education. Every teacher who has graduated in the United States or Canada since 1992 had at least some measure of Marxist brainwashing as part of their educational program to get their degree. Every single one. No exceptions. That's how poisoned that is. That's got to be fixed. But this same formula works here, not the unity one. The formula is if you capture the colleges of education, then you capture the teachers. If you capture the teachers, you capture the next generation of students. And if you capture the next generation of students, you capture the future. In the churches, if you capture the seminaries, like colleges of education, then you capture the pastors, who are like the teachers. Then you capture the laity, which are like the students. Then you capture the soul of a nation. So in 2016, Klaus Schwab put out, well, the World Economic Forum put out a white paper. I'm not going to give it to Klaus Schwab called The Role of Faith in Global Challenges. And it starts with a pull quote from Klaus Schwab that says, values cannot be justified by intellect alone, 
that requires faith. They've had a project to take over the churches from within for a long time. They know they have to take over the churches from within because they know that the churches are the strongest transmitter of values that they can't corrupt anywhere. That's why Gramsci said socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. They know that if your fealty, your faith, your duty lies with Almighty God, it does not lie with the state. They know that, and they know that that's an impossible impediment for them. So what do they do? Well, if they can't destroy something, they subvert it. They infiltrate and subvert. So they've had this plan. I told you about Gramsci, maybe 1928, just to be poetic, we'll say it was 1928 that he writes this thing about socialism. Give or take, literally just a few years. He died in 37, so it can't be that many. 80 years later, 2008, any of y'all ever heard of a book called The Purpose Driven Life? Yeah, yeah. Pastor Rick Warren, right? America's pastor. This is why, by the way, I get told that I don't get invited as many places as I could. I name names. Pastor Rick Warren, you can look this up. Unfortunately, it's the middle of like an hour-long thing, so you have to find his part somewhere near the middle. It's like a panel he's doing at Davos, World Economic Forum, icons all on the wall behind him. There he's sitting there talking to the audience. You can imagine what that audience is. It's the movers and shakers that are building out the global agenda. And he's sitting there and he's telling them, he's bargaining with them. In fact, he's almost threatening them, America's pastor is. He's saying, you know what? You've got your public-private partnership. You've got the government and you've got the businesses and you've got them coordinating with each other. But that's only two legs and a stool needs three. That's really what he said. Stool needs three legs. You only have two. And there are five, he's almost like he's threatening them. There are 5.5 billion people of faith on this planet, and most of us will not go along with this unless you have faith too. You need us more than we need you. In other words, he's like, you better make some deals with me. I think that Pastor Warren, if I might give him some advice, should go read Matthew chapter 4, where Satan tempts Jesus and says, all this could be yours, and see how that one turns out, but... Maybe it's beyond me to give the pastor advice. So in 2008, which if you're doing the math on your fingers is 15 years ago, Rick Warren sat at Davos and explained, you have to incorporate faith initiatives into your schemes or we're not going to go along. And the tone that he gives, and you can watch it for yourself, is what's in it for me, by the way. A purpose-driven life. I'm not sure what the purpose is that he's driving toward, but it doesn't seem to be the one that's in the Bible, <laughs> if I might be so bold. But this is just to say that we're talking, Rick Warren is just one guy. Lots of leaders in lots of faiths have had similar moments and similar deals, not sitting on the stage at Davos doing this kind of thing. And there's lots, by the way, if you look him up, he talks at Davos a lot. Rick Warren has worked with Davos a lot. There are lots of leaders who have incorporated themselves into these agendas for good or bad reasons. Good reasons would be that they thought they were doing something good, like, for instance, bringing Christianity to China, only to get bought off by CCP agents, which was really the point when they went over there. They thought they were going to do a mission, but really they just got purchased. Oh, yeah, we can really help you build a gigantic ministry back home. We can really get your dreams moving. Yeah, eight-figure check, no big deal. We got that. CCP doesn't care about money. It's no big deal. Just sign a check. Whoops. Matthew 4 again. <laughs> How about that? Lots of different reasons. But the church had to be captured from within. So let me tell you, though, that this, I mentioned that this drag queen, the whole thing, is a provocation. Now, I'm in a big trouble. This is actually what got me on the SPLC list more than the cultural Marxism, is I named a name that's made up that's called Drag Floyd. I don't know if you know who George Floyd was, and you remember what happened when George Floyd died, and I said, they want Drag Floyd. Does everybody follow me on what drag Floyd would be then? So these drag queens start out wearing ridiculous but fairly modest costumes. They're in libraries. They're sweet. It's all kind of contained. They read just normal stories, but it's still a drag queen doing it. 
Then the next thing you know, the outfit's a little more provocative. The next thing you know, it's at a bar. The next thing you know, it's in the public park, and there's all kinds of, like, activities going on that are way outside of, you know, reading a story. This is called an escalating provocation. When you see an escalating provocation in a political warfare in, uh, area or regime, you can guarantee, or re, what am I looking for? Uh, battle space, I guess. You can guarantee that the purpose is to provoke a reaction. Oh, you didn't react to that? We're going to turn it up a little bit. You didn't react to that? We're going to turn it up a little bit. And Drag Floyd would be a very valuable tool for them, a revolutionary martyr in maybe Mao's language, very useful tool for them. Somebody flips out, punches a drag queen, grabs a hold of them, throws them down, or something stupider, and you can imagine how this would play out in the media. You don't have to think for two seconds how this would play out in the media. Well, I don't know if you know that for several years now, the federal government and the Department of Homeland Security, the January 6th House Unselect Committee, blah, 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 have been creating a long set of dossiers, a long narrative that's being reinforced already in the, in the mass media and has been for years, that the real cause, so for example, this is a real document I read recently, the real cause of January 6th was Donald Trump, right? No, it wasn't. It was Christian nationalism. It was Christian nationalism, which is actually related to violence, domestic extremism, confederacy, neo-confederate values. I know you got Dixie Rock here. Watch out. <laughs> I'm from Dixie. I mean, come on. It's fine. <laughs> Christian nationalism, which has actually weirdly spontaneously become this small fringe movement of people saying very radical things. And then a lot of people kind of confused about the term, but they think, well, I'm kind of Christian. Yeah, I believe in the nation. Or I'm really Christian. I believe in the nation. So... Okay, Christian nationalism, yeah, I think it should be a Christian nation. Yeah, we were founded on a lot of Christian principles. It's a Christian nation. Turns out that these insinuations made by the federal government and to the federal government are really thin, too. If I stood up here and I prayed and I said uh, something like, you know, Lord God, bless our nation, amen. I've now mixed Christian. I guess I have to say in Jesus' name, amen. I've now mixed Christianity and nation. I'm a Christian nationalist. I'm not kidding. There are things that are that thin in these reports to and from the federal government on the rising threat of extremism from Christian nationalists. Now, the primary thing that the Christian nationalist movement is spouting off on about online is what a per overwhelming and terrible sin homosexuality is. And it's time to start. You have a few of them who might actually be infiltrating federal agents. I have no idea saying very extreme things like maybe it is time to throw them off roofs like we see in the Middle East. Maybe it is execute. Maybe it is forced conversion or expulsion from our country. Maybe it was letting them have gay marriage and now look how crazy it's gone. In other words, the rhetoric is matching the arc that's already written in the federal documents that will be used to justify a response from the government. You get drag Floyd and all of a sudden Christian nationalism is going to be the next biggest thing in the country, and they are going to be pressuring and examining and investigating independent small churches because the big, the big uh, conventions and associations and all of that are already gearing up to be regime approved. The three selfs church in China, it's Christian sort of. I mean, the cross behind the wall is set on a Chinese flag with uh, Mao's head over here and Xi Jinping's head next to it. It's very, very Christian-y. <laughs> very, feels very Christian, but uh, they have Christianity in China, right? They're real Christianity, of course. This is what you will see is a government-approved Christianity is the only kind that can probably survive, and they're going to use the excuse off of this to crush the church. So will the church survive? Yeah, we can put these pieces together and see what will happen. Will there be a church in this future regime that we're going? So if we read Julie's book, and there was Christianity still in Russia, but it was very, very contained, Soviet Union, but it was very contained. But they were actually pretty brutal to the churches too, like brutal. I don't think we're going to see a lot of brutality in the churches, and I think we have people like Pastor Rick Warren to thank for that. What we will see instead is that we will see a LDS church that goes to temple and looks LDS and the words there are Mormon and everything looks like it's supposed to, except it's always sustainability and inclusion coming out of the religious lesson. You're going to have a Catholic church and the guy's going to have his collar and it's going to be the priest and he's going to do the whole thing and you're going to have the cracker and the whole thing's going to happen, but you're going to have a sustainability and inclusion homily on 
the carefully chosen passages of the Bible. You're going to have your um, Baptist church, and if there's any Baptists in here, I was raised Catholic, so I, the first time I went to a Baptist church, I was like, why is there a drum set here? <laughs> like, that's a guitar. That doesn't go to church. I was a little shocked. So you're going to have your guitar, you're going to have your drum set, you're going to have your youth pastor, he's going to be wearing flannel and jeans. That's going to be the main pastor, I'm sorry. And he's going to be standing on the youth pastor in a t-shirt and jeans, or khakis maybe. And he's going to stand up there and he's going to say kind of very evangelical Baptist sounding things and there's going to be the baptisms and everything else and they're going to dunk you in very sustainable water and the whole thing. It's going to be the same thing. So what I'm telling you is you can think of there being one religion in the world at that point which is going to be shown in a thousand faces. In other words, you can think of religion like a diamond. It's like one stone, but it has a bunch of faces. And one face is Baptist, and one face is Catholic, and one face is Mormon, and one face is Buddhist, and one face is Jewish. And so they do whatever it is they do. Call to prayer five times a day for the Muslims? Yeah, but you're praying to sustainability. What you're going to see is fake imitations of every single world religion that all preach the same message and this new religion of sustainability and inclusion. Why? Because Klaus Schwab said values cannot be justified by intellect alone. For that, you need faith. And Rick Warren said you have to get all 5.5 billion of us, Christians, Catholics, Mormons, I don't know if he named Mormons, Buddhists, Jews, Sikhs, you've got to get all of us on board or it's not going to happen. So you're going to have one faith, which in the old Latin was called the Prisca Theologia, which is what the Gnostics and the Hermeticists believed in. It is the ancient faith. All the faiths are actually just a reflection of the one true deeper faith. And if you understand the true secret meaning hidden behind it, which is sustainability and inclusion, then you have the true faith, and it can be practiced as Baptist, it can be practiced as Catholic, it can be practiced as secular humanist, it can be practiced as a physics program at a university, which will also be sustainable and inclusive. Every science, every philosophy, every religion, all just faces on the same diamond, the one true religion. And that's what we're going to see as the future. The only way they can get that is by clamping down on religious liberty. They have to kill religious liberty. You will not be free to read the scripture and understand it or form a relationship with God as it's informed by that. Choosing your own pastor, because churches outside of the official conventions that have their official statements of faith that will be retooled and geared toward this agenda, inch by inch by inch, maybe over 10 years, maybe not tomorrow, probably by 2030 actually, that's seven years. 2030 is an important year for them. You're going to see all the churches slowly, all the faiths slowly creep, creep, creep under massive doctrinal statements to support this agenda. The Southern Baptist Convention, sort of famously conservative in 2019, brought critical race theory and intersectionality in as an analytical tool. They said subordinate to scripture because they don't understand communism or they're communists and lying, one or the other, because nothing stays subordinate to communism that should read that they're bringing critical race theory and intersectionality in as an analytical tool to subordinate scripture. They got the two and subordinate backwards. The, criti the, the critical race theory got explicitly and intentionally brought into the Southern Baptist Convention in 2019 under some pretty shady operations at the convention that year. Don't have to go into the details of that. But that's what you're going to watch is the slow transformation of the big religious associations and churches that are members are okay, and independent churches are going to find it harder and harder and harder to operate. Oh, you're political. You're a hotbed of domestic extremism. Maybe the FBI has to come visit and see what you're doing. Maybe we need to subpoena all your emails. Maybe you gave a political message from the pulpit. Now you've got to be investigated or have your tax status stripped. Independent churches will be crushed. The ones under the official conventions will be protected, and the official conventions will be completely captured and corrupted. And you can just picture how this goes, and you end up with a fake church worshiping this one new religion under a bunch of different frocks. doesn't matter which one it looks like. That's the future of church, is to create the one weird new age religion 
that is going to transform mankind with the 17 sustainable development goals to transform our world using the same mechanisms as, as it turns out, social emotional learning. So we kind of circle back to education, which by the way, social emotional learning is being dragged into churches now. Of, of course it is. Where did social emotional learning come from? Anybody know about social emotional learning and where it came from? It came from a place called the Fetzer Institute. In nine, uh, was, it, was it 2000? No, sorry, 1995. Got my stories mixed up. I was thinking of comprehensive sexuality education coming from the United Nations in 2003. 2003 was a banner year for them. So did ESG, 2003. 1995, social emotional learning arises out of the Fetzer Institute. John Fetzer was a theosophist. Does that word mean anything to you? He was a new age charlatan is what he was. He was a crackpot. And he totally believed in a new age transformational religion. He had seances. He believed that he channeled the Archangel Gabriel that gave him business instructions, all kinds of crazy stuff. But a lot of his work was based off of one of his favorite occultists by the name of Alice Bailey, who wrote a book in the 30s at some point called Education in the New Age. And Alice Bailey was an open occultist. She said the point of education was to teach the science of right human relations, which sounds like teaching kids to be sustainable and inclusive. And social emotional learning was built out of that. Now, Alice Bailey made her own publishing company because she couldn't publish her book. So what was the name of the publishing company she founded in 1922? The Lucifer Publishing Company which is now called the Lucis Trust, L-U-C-I-S. You can look that up. Its headquarters is in uh, 866 United Nations Plaza. It is the print publisher for the United Nations. It's a little weird, isn't it? It's a little weird. And they openly and vigorously support in prayer and meditation every year the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos. And that's where social emotional learning came from. So. The point of all of that kind of history and kind of meandering story is that Marxism is certainly here in America. They're using a Maoist cultural revolution to transform our society. It has something to do with the World Economic Forum, and we could talk about ESG. It's a whole other thing, how that works. But the goal is that those institutions have to be infiltrated. They've got media, my goodness. And they are getting law as they planned incrementally on the other side. They have got education. So our children, but the goal of getting education isn't just to get education, it's to get children. They don't have our children yet. Not all of them. In fact, not most of them. And that can be stopped. To get faith, they know that they have to disrupt the family, capture faith, and capture children through education. That's their goal. That's what their agenda is. So that tells you exactly the things you need to do. There's lots of things we could talk about, very policies and like strategies and do we boycott this? Do we get mad at that beer or this beer? Are we supposed to be mad at our chicken sandwich? What are we supposed to be mad at this week? There's a lot of things that we could talk about in that regard, but the most basic, fundamental, simple lesson is if they don't get your children, they don't succeed. If they do get your children, it doesn't matter if we stop everything else. So lesson number one, what does an average person do is you protect your kids. And you help your neighbors, not by doing something stupid, obviously. You help your neighbors learn to realize that they need to protect their kids. And you start building out support networks to help each other do this. Because it is a lot of work. You must protect your children. You must not give them your children. Opt them out of as much of these things that go that direction as you possibly can. Spend time with them. Nourish the relationship. The number one thing recorded by a psychiatrist studying prisoners who are coming out of China during Mao's regime, that's, that, that obviously they came out, they had left, they escaped. Why did you do it? My mom didn't want me to. My dad didn't want me to. I love my parents too much to split from them. You nourish those relationships, you build something that communists can't take away. Protect your children. Secondly, you have to realize that the main avenues of attack at your children are entertainment and school. Now, normally, entertainment's a little bit out of your hands. You can control what they consume somewhat. I had kids, I know, my kid, I couldn't talk my younger daughter into going outside. We couldn't pay our younger daughter to go outside when she was a young teenager. Then all of a sudden, she wanted to go to the library. We're like, well, okay, it's a library, that's cool. But we're not driving you to the library every day. We'll drive you to the library sometimes. 
But you can walk to the library, but granted, you have to walk through the park. The park goes there. But it's almost four miles each way. But if you really want to go to the library, live in a fairly safe area, it's good for you to develop some skills, you can walk to the library. We're not going to drive you very often, but you can walk however often you want to the library. This child who would not go outside walked to the library every single day. Every day. We're like, what the heck? She really likes the library. She must be reading a lot. No, she wasn't. We didn't let her get on social media at home when she was logging in on the computers at the library. <laughs> so it's hard to filter what comes into kids. You can protect them. The media is a difficult environment. But the schools should be, in a tr society that's not subverted, the schools should be s bringing them back as well. No, no, no. That stuff you're seeing on Disney is weird. That's not really appropriate. You know, go talk to your parents about that. But instead, the schools are dragging them into a system of affirmation and pushing the issue and raising the issue and making the right answers be always in line with equity, sustainable, and inclusion for every single thing they do. So you have to protect them from the schools, and we have to start fighting to take our schools back. We have to start fighting smart battles against our schools, like teaching anti-communism because we know they're going to flip out whether we get it or not. Are they going to get it in Utah? I don't know. Are you going to get it in California? No. But what do you want? You want them to flip out that you tried. This has to happen in every state, all 50 states. But the faith aspect is one that's really, I think, something we're not paying attention to enough. We've been comfortable for a long time. People are asleep. I don't know exactly. I know that you guys have the be kind thing in, in the LDS church. Well, there's a poison of winsomeness in the evangelical church. That perfectionism thing really took off. And you're going to be winsome. you got to be nice. Well, he's a brother. Can't call out a brother. We've got to start identifying where the problems are coming from and taking a stand and making sure that our li religious liberty doesn't come under threat by our, our church leadership creeping away from us. They're only human, too. Their temptations are real, too. It's hard. So we have to be aware, though, that our faith has to be grounded. If you're going to study your faith, if your faith is important to you, if you understand that this battle is ultimately spiritual, you've got to study your faith. You've got to get grounded in your faith. You've got to get solid in these values. You've got to spend time because the communists will twist your values against you. They'll tell you that love your neighbor means shut yourself in your house for two years. They'll tell you that love your neighbor means strap this communist symbol on your face for two years. They'll tell you that it means taking an injection of this thing that, well, yeah, we kind of tested it, <laughs> sort of, or else you're unwashed masses, pandemic of the unvaccinated, the whole thing. That's love thy neighbor. I got protested. I spoke in Chicago a couple of days ago and because there were some people mad about the things that we were going to say about trans. There was literally a lady in her, I think, 60s standing out there holding a sign that said, love thy neighbor. That's what it said on her protest sign, love thy neighbor. They will twist your values against you. So you better know your values inside and out. You better understand your 1 Timothy, Timothy 3.15 if that matters to you and know that you can give a proper and appropriate answer when it's asked of you to defend your faith. These are your commands. You must be able to do this. We also have to keep faith. I was so happy. The passion that we opened this room with was that there is overwhelming faith in this room in this country still. And in our Constitution and our ability in the people, we the people, to rise up and save this country. That is what's going to save this country, is faith. <laughs> but it's really easy to lose sight. It's really easy to get complacent. Sometimes I hear from evangelicals like, well, Jesus is coming back soon, so I'll just wait till then. He'll fix it. <laughs> Good luck answering for that one, buddy. That's something I wouldn't want to stand on Judgment Day and be like, well, I figured you're on your way. <laughs> I hear from Christians a lot, it's too late, which I love. I hear that from a lot of people. The kids call this a black pill. You know, the red pill is when you learn to see reality. The blue pill means you went back to CNN. And <laughs> the white pill means you believe it might work out. Well, the black pill means we're doomed, right? That's a black pill. And it's a doomer mentality where it's too late already. It's too late. It's already too late. I love it. People say this to me all the time, and I really don't like it. But I love it when a Christian says it to me. 
because I get to do a very communist thing and put their values back on them. Do you doubt God's timing? Did you read Esther? Were you not raised up for such a time as this? You have to fight. This is our country. This is our hour. Average everyday people, the most important thing you can do is protect your children and get grounded in your values and start sharing those with other people. Teaching them about this stuff, learning about what's happening and how it works. I didn't go into how it works so we could have that detailed conversation if they bring me back to Utah about how the ESG and all of the CEI scores and all these numbers work to extort our companies into forcing uh, LGBT and other woke stuff on us. There are things we can do about that too. But the most important thing we can do is protect our kids, get grounded in our values, get grounded in the history and the values of this country. If you don't know what we're saving, we're not going to save it. I tell you, this is something you can do. Bring your kids to this. I know this is a very family-oriented place because it's, uh, I stay in a lot of hotels. I stay in hotels like literally three nights a week, almost every week. And you know what? I never almost experienced in hotels before this trip? Children. Well, they run up and down the hall very early in the morning, very late at night, all the time. <laughs> there were three, four, three, four thousand of them eating breakfast. Every <laughs> waffle, with, I guess sugar's a Mormon thing because it was all there. And so, lots of children, but you've got to protect those children. You've got to, got to raise them up in the values. And so what you can do, though, is you, I said, you've got to know what we're protecting. When's the last time, and I know some of you have done it, when's the last time, just think about it for yourself, you don't have to say anything, last time you read the Declaration of Independence? High school, maybe? When's the last time you read the Constitution, or at least the preamble? When's the last time you read at least the you know, interesting parts of the, say, Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. When's the last time that you read the interesting parts of your state constitution? Turns out Tennessee's is really awesome. If you don't like Utah's, go read ours. It's really good. Utah's is awesome. Okay, I've not read Utah's. Tennessee's is great. I tell people about it, and I'm like, I wish mine was like that. You should be sitting down and spending time. When's the last time you read the Federalist Papers? When's the last time you read the arguments that formed this basis, this experiment in liberty? And guess what? People do Bible studies. Why don't you do founding document studies? Why don't you bring your kids? You know they're not getting a civics education at school, so why don't you sit down and go through the Declaration of Independence line by line, dig into the history of it. You've got a whole homeschool, you've got a whole year-long course. One document, the Declaration of Independence, right there. And guess what? Bring your friends and whatever you know sugary treats you guys all eat because <laughs> the adults need it too. So you can study that. Some of you have the mind for it. Some of you, it's not your talent. That's fine. Everybody has different talents. And you that's between you and God. Figure out your talents. Do what you can. But some of you have the talents to learn to read this woke garbage. So you can tell people when it says that, this is what it means. Because not everybody can do that. And if you have that talent, I have that talent, you can do it. Some of you have a much worse talent, which is you can read legislation. You can read policy. I'm going to not lie to you. I can't. I'm a smart dude. I can't do it. I look at that, and I just go cross-eyed. I don't know what it says. So you know what that means? When I show up to the state house and try to talk to a legislator, I'm useless. If something gets snuck in there, I can't spot it. Somebody better be able to do that. If you have the talent or can teach yourself to learn to read legislation, you guess what? You're a watchdog. You have to get organized. It's not just about getting educated and sharing information. we got to get organized. One of the most important jobs that any organization has is somebody who just makes sure that, say, the facility is available. Or that if there's speakers, somebody got picked up from the airport. Or if there's flyers, somebody made sure they got printed. In other words, you don't even have to lead an organization. They have tons of clerical support, secretarial kind of things that need to happen. One of the most valuable things, I was working with an organization for a little while. They had a woman. She was fabulous. All she did was when there was legislation, she wanted testimony, or when there was something that needed to be done, is she just made a list of the people that were affiliated that knew something about the subject, and she just emailed them. Hey, or texted them if they had a number. Hey, this is happening on Tuesday. You got 15 minutes. It'll be at 3.15. And then on Tuesday, hey, it's 2 o'clock. You still good for 3.15? And just kept people on point to show up. Made some big differences. Made some big differences. Those kinds of things are all needed. Everybody doesn't have to be running around doing some huge grant. Everybody, not everybody's Matt Walsh. We're not all 
Jordan Peterson or whoever else. We're not all somebody who's going to run for political office. There's a million things that you can do. But what you cannot do, what you cannot do is fall into that trap that Jesus is coming back soon, or even if that's not your excuse, I'm going to sit on the couch. I'm scared. It's too big for me. I'm going to wait this one out. It'll blow over. It's too exhausting. I don't even want to think about it anymore. Let me tell you, they want you to quit. So you can't quit. But you cannot, cannot, cannot sit this one out. It's time to get off the couch. It's time to talk to your neighbor and get your neighbor off the couch. The most important thing to do after protecting your children is raising awareness and spreading information. Following with that, with being organized. You think I talk? You all are smart. I know you're smart because you're here, because only smart people want to listen to me. <laughs> you got my governor he, him joke immediately. <laughs> Actually, I'm not, it's not a joke. It's real. It's sadly real. He is a joke. That's right. <laughs> Y'all are smart, though, and smart people come to my events, and they come up to me, and they're like, James, we all already know this. We need action. And I'm like, really? If you went over to your next door neighbor, and I know I'm in southern Utah, so maybe the answer is yes, but if you went to your next door neighbor and said to them, you know that the real problem why all this stuff that's happening in the schools comes down to the United Nations, are they going to look at you like you've lost your ever-loving mind? And they're like, yeah, this one guy, he's like, yeah. Like, yeah, you're not done informing people. The people showing up to these things are getting informed. Most of your neighbors are not. I heard there's 95,000 or some odd people, thousand people in this county. There are not 95,000 people in this crowd. There's a lot of message spreading. There's a lot of educating. There's a lot of getting out and talking to people to do still. And we are early in the raising awareness phase. That 3.5% of the population that's awake, aware, and willing to be active is what we are trying to recruit. And that starts overwhelmingly, whatever your talents are, with you who know a little bit more about what's going on. And I'll just urge you one last time. I say this sometimes pretty brutal. I'll say it brutal to you all. If you all can go home and sleep tonight without some idea of something that you might start to do to take this on soon, maybe not tomorrow, it's Father's Day. That is something you can do, actually, but... Take this on soon. If you can sleep tonight without some sense of what you can do, I said it in Idaho, I'll say it to you, you're my enemy. We must do something about this. We must be smart. We must not fall into the reactionary trap that will trigger them to clamp down on us. We must step up and inform and protect our kids and, and, and take our country back. There's no more excuse. Thank you for letting me tell you that.